Okay, hard gig last speaker. I know what you're thinking. Energy levels are low, you'd like a break. We're running a bit over and I've copped the lawyer as the last speaker. So I can empathise with that. Um, given the topic is a proactive approach, um, I intend to talk about the proactive stage, which is well before the legal stage. So hopefully, as a lawyer, we can talk very little about the legal side of this issue and actually focus on the practical sides from a management perspective. Um, my, my emphasis or perspective is more around um, protecting businesses and that means dealing with managers. So um, I very much endorse what's been um, said by uh, the earlier speakers. And as I say, my particular perspective on it is really looking at it more from the managerial um, view of the world. So as legal as we get is to just put up the definition that Paul did earlier around that's what is workplace bullying. And I want to do that really to then focus on what's not workplace bullying because there's more things that aren't workplace bullying than what is workplace bullying. Um, it's a serious issue and it's a, required a serious response which, which Parliament did respond to. Um, unfortunately, one of the downsides of that is it's become the sort of go-to label to describe most forms of interpersonal conflict at the workplace um, or, or relationship issues and the difficulty with that of course is that often then what happens is that we have those serious response actions that bullying does require being applied to what often can just be um, conflict between people or, or really just inappropriate behaviour. And so some of these other things can also be bullying but not necessarily so. Um, they are complex and technical and they keep lawyers employed, but often looking at these things do little to actually get to the root cause of what's going on in a workplace so you can then look at how you resolve an issue. This is not a statistic, this is more an anecdotal um, observation, but from our perspective, really 95% of the workplace issues that land across an employment lawyer's desk really either involve what could be better described as inappropriate behaviour or certainly just had their early genesis in inappropriate behaviour and then had escalated into something else. And what I really want to give you today I suppose is the main takeaway is to, in, in, in adopting a proactive approach to dealing with bullying as a manager is to think of the language around inappropriate behaviours, what behaviours are appropriate or inappropriate, professional or unprofessional, acceptable or unacceptable in the workplace, and using that type of language is really important for early intervention. So what's the problem? If I'm going to give you any sort of practical solutions today, we need to have a problem to solve. Um, from our perspective, a lot of the issues, and Julie touched, uh, Julianne touched upon these, is red flags just aren't dealt with early enough. So often there's a perception in management that if I don't have a formal complaint, then I can't do anything about it. So quite often there will be um, behaviour in the workplace that everybody knows a particular employee engages in, but there's the perception, well, if I don't have a formal complaint, I can't do anything about it or I have to give up people's names. And so what that often leads to is just a bit of a do-nothing approach, the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. And of course what happens over time is that bubbles up to the surface and then sooner or later we have our firefighting situation where it's all systems go. We have formal complaints, investigators being reported, we have workers' comp stress claims that Julianne's spoken about, um, we have the Fair Work Commission bullying jurisdiction which I'm going to touch upon towards the end and it's a bonanza for lawyers to get involved. And so what I want to say in terms of being proactive is to look at investigations as an option of last resort. So I'm not standing up and saying that workplace investigations aren't important and don't have they, their place. They absolutely do. But what I see too often is it just becomes the option of first resort where unfortunately if managers are unsure what to do with a problem that's been bubbling up, when it finally sort of lands in their lap, there's a kind of a feeling of I've handballed it now to an investigator, so I've kind of got it off my desk, I've done something about it, I can feel good. We've got an investigation, it's all being set up. 
And of course, all that does is buy a bit of time because sooner or later, and unfortunately often it's later, much later and after much money and time and expense, a report lands which may or may not give us the answers we want and then we have to deal with the issue. So the big difficulty with the investigation, if we're looking at it from bullying or inappropriate behaviours, is it's all backwards looking. It's all about looking into the past and determining what happened. And that involves framing up allegations and having evidence and making findings. And that may or may not even land the pin on the tail of the, of the, of the donkey. Of course people involved in that process are going to be very protective and the vulnerability that Julianne um, spoke about, which I very much agree with, you're not going to see any of that, are you? You're not going to see a manager saying, well, you know, I think on reflection that perhaps I'm a little bit abrasive at times in my management style. Look, I can be a bit of a micromanager, I must admit I get a bit too picky. Um, perhaps I could improve my management style. You're not going to get any of that when you've got a formal investigation going on. The alternative <coughs> is to look at other response action measures which are forward looking and that's all about instead of what happened, what will happen and the what will happen then involves some responsibility on the part of the parties okay? because then that shifts the conversation to what do people want by way of resolution and that means well, what's the root cause, what are the actual issues we're dealing with here and how do we resolve them. Very, very different framework. Um, to investigations which, as I say from my perspective, um, costly, complex and time consuming and often really the process itself will drive an outcome because people um, will leave an organisation because they can't handle the stress of being under investigation or having a complaint and there's a lot of stakes put into if my complaint's not upheld and accepted then I'm going to be accused of making a vexatious complaint or my complaint's not made in good faith. And on the other end of the coin, there can sometimes be a bit of pressure. Well, look, our head's got to roll out of all of this. We've spent so much money on it. Um, if, if we just, if we have you know, some sort of proactive solution to it, it's not going to justify the management dollars and time that's been spent on the process. And of course, mental health issues at play always going to be exaggerate and exacerbate the situation. And the traditional approach to this, and, and it's certainly one that I've been involved in advising on in dealing with those particular mental health issues, is to have the don't ask, don't tell approach. So that is if I treat an employee who I may have some behavioural issues with, their performance or their conduct, if I treat them in the same way that I treat an employee who, who is engaging in that behaviour but didn't have a mental illness, then I'll be right. And look, the reality is for discrimination law in this country, that is the case. Um, there's a High Court case involving a, a naughty school child that, that said just that, that a, that a naughty school child without a particular mental condition behaving that way um, would be treated the same and therefore there's no unlawful discrimination. But that situation is very much changing. So what do the recent cases tell us in terms of how is that changing and how is that changed the approach? My view, the, the onus really has become heavier and it really is largely because of things today and things like today with the, with the good work that um, Cameron and Paul in particular have done with their presentation increases the level of understanding around mental health issues and bullying it increases the awareness and there's a greater level of general sophistication in workplaces about these issues. But with that knowledge comes greater responsibility. And that's where we're seeing it starting to play out now in the cases. So a couple of quick cases to illustrate it so I can earn my spot as a lawyer being up here talking about law. Swan and Monash Law Book Cooperative involved <coughs> a assistant at the Monash Law Bookshop who was being subjected to some pretty serious bullying from her manager, a very traditional sort of nasty behaviours, aggressive, micromanaging and just chipping away at a long period of time. And that behaviour actually came to the board's attention and the board was well aware of it, um, but she didn't want anything done about it. 
and she said, oh, I don't want to make a formal complaint as such. And I find the language of informal and formal pretty unhelpful, actually. Um, pretty much everything you're being told in the workplace is in the context of you being a manager for that organisation. <clears throat> so the board did nothing, as asked. And the situation then escalated. So for those of you who are looking at the pictures, what do you think happened after that? Somewhere over half a million dollars was the payout. And the key, key takeaway from that is that if something's on the table, or it reasonably ought to be known to be on the table, an employer has to deal with it. It's no excuse to say, I didn't have a formal complaint. And it's no excuse to say, well, the employee didn't want me to do anything about it. In fact, they expressly told me not to do anything about it. And, and the example I give is a pretty extreme one, but I say, well, if an employee came and said, look, I was working on the sports field and I was sexually assaulted by a colleague, but I don't want you to do anything about it, what would you do as a manager? Ring the police and deal with it. So yes, an employee's wishes are relevant um, in terms of putting it into the mix about what a reasonable response action, but it's not the solely decisive thing. Another case that's hot off the press from um, a couple of months ago is a case in the Queensland Supreme Court that got up for bullying. The actual facts aren't that particularly unique or interesting. It involved an admin assistant in an aged care home who was overworked. So it's a classic case of just too much work, not enough resources, was visibly displaying signs of distress and also had the manager that engaged in pretty aggressive, tyrannical type of behaviours. The straw that broke the camel's back was a telephone call that the employee had done the wrong thing and the manager gave her a huge roasting and she left and never came back to the workplace. Why that's an interesting case though, it's the first time in Australia that really the concept of what's a set of facts that amounts to bullying, and so as I say, it's a very textbook bullying type case, actually amounted to negligence and then resulted in a payout of $436,000. And what I find interesting about that is that, partly in my view, the legal issues turned around the concept of reasonable foreseeability. And again, it's things like today, the education and the awareness that will lead courts to increasingly say that more and more of these things are reasonably foreseeable in the circumstances. Lastly, an unfair dismissal case. What's interesting about this one is that the employee had a serious mental health issue and he had engaged in some various things like refusing to work as directed and had sent a bunch of really inappropriate emails being highly critical of senior management around to the whole of the workplace. And he had been suffering from pretty long-standing mental health issues that the employer was aware of and he'd had a lot of time off and the employer was aware of all of those issues. What happened is the employer adopted the traditional approach that I spoke about earlier and said, well, look, that's a disciplinary matter. We're framing up misconduct allegations. Um, we would treat anybody who engaged in that type of behaviour the same, regardless of whether they had mental health issues or not, terminated the employee. Now here's the difference, this has gone off to the Fair Work Commission which deals with unfair dismissals. So it looks at whether the dismissal was unfair, not whether it would satisfy those discrimination type laws that I spoke about earlier. And what it said was that knowing that the employee had these serious mental health issues that were inextricably linked to those behaviours and then jumping to frame them up as serious misconduct and terminating on a disciplinary basis was unfair in the circumstances and the claim got up. So some of you must be sitting there thinking, does that mean I can't do anything about those type of behaviours? Do we just have to accept that in that situation? Of course the answer is no, that's not the case at all. But what I'm putting to you today, and consistent with the proactive approach, is look at the behaviours in terms of their appropriateness, deal with the mental health issues and deal with it more as a performance or capacity rather than having the first go-to resort being formal investigations and disciplinary matters. Because ultimately, it's going to be a case of it's an incapacity issue because the employee can't turn up to work 
and not send disparaging emails about senior management on, on the all staff list, okay, because of the mental condition, and that's fine, that's an inherent requirement of the job, uh, not to denigrate um, the management team to all of the staff. Or alternatively, the medical evidence will show that um, with the proper treatment and medication, that there's no reason why the mental illness would be causing that, and then you're free to deal with those behaviours on their own, as I say, um, as, as, a, as a performance issue that way, rather than jumping straight to the disciplinary misconduct. And that ties into the proactive approach, and this is really consistent with what the other speakers have spoken about as a general way of looking at this issue of bullying and inappropriate behaviour in the workplace, my preference is to adopt a work, work health and safety approach to the issue. So that really is the building block. And as Julianne talked about, psychological hazards are hazards that need to be identified and you need to do a risk assessment on psychological issues. Um, inappropriate behaviours and then take the reasonable response action. It's the right thing to do and it also gives the maximum um, flexibility to a manager to take what the appropriate action is. Whereas if we jump into our traditional going straight to the term bullying, then we're back to this needs some allegations, this needs an investigation, and so when you're trying to then proactively deal with some of these issues, you can also be met with a fair bit of resistance from all the parties saying, well, why do I have to attend this meeting? What are the allegations? Are you doing an investigation? You can't do this, you can't direct me to do that, okay? If we're adopting a work health and safety perspective, we're not advocating, we're not taking sides, we're not making allegations, we're not commencing a disciplinary process. All we're doing as an employer is doing what the law requires us to do, and that's to make sure that we take reasonable steps to provide a safe workplace. And what are reasonable steps to provide a safe workplace include asking questions at times and trying to ascertain whether or not there are risks that there are inappropriate behaviours going on that could have a detrimental effect. So for the work health and safety boffins, um, the approach um, enables the employer to determine how they're going to assess that risk. And that's why an employer may be within its rights to say, I don't care that a complainant is telling me they want their formal complaint investigated with an investigator employed, appointed. I'm not going to do that. That's not reasonable response action. This is not a serious risk with a serious magnitude attached to it. Equally, at the other end of the extreme, it may well be a situation that despite an employee not wanting something to be dealt with, an employer is saying no reasonable response action is something more. So that second layer is looking at then whether the behaviours are inappropriate or appropriate rather than just jumping to is this bullying, is this harassment? And I don't have a magic bullet answer for that. Um, often these issues are a question of degree. Again, dealing with managers, I've put up what we broadly described as four type of management styles. And if you look at that first style up there, it's very much a strategic type of leader who leads from the front. And you can see what the gifts on the left-hand side of that management style are. So there's no doubt they are the virtues that people in the workplace really reap the benefit of. But at what point on the unhealthy side does that management style become aggressive, dictatorial or disrespectful? Again, the second style is that classic influencer that has the ability to get people on board and get everybody on the bus in a, in a, in a way that sometimes that first style can be a bit too crash through. But for those people who've dealt with those high energy, positive, upbeat, charismatic leaders, at what point do their behaviours become oversharing, indiscreet, favouritism, being friends with employees and not with others and all of the issues that that causes that can sometimes lead to bullying type complaints. Our third style is the least likely manager to ever end up on the receiving end of a bullying complaint. And if you are that relationship based person who is, who is collaborative, consultative, care about your people, always instinctively thinking of others, there's no doubt that your management style is the least likely to ever end up um, 
on the receiving end of a bullying complaint. But here's the problem with that style that I've seen in my experience, is often the downside of the unhealthy side is not showing up with managerial authority, not actually bringing that A game as a manager. And so it's the behaviours that are going on in the workplace that other people are engaging in that that manager's not turning up and dealing with. And that's the issue. And lastly, our executor type leadership style. Those leaders who get things done are often the analytical type. They like to have lists. They've been promoted into management because of their technical excellence. And now they're being asked to deal with people, which wasn't something they thought they'd signed up for. Um, the downside is that that's the classic management style that will be on the receiving end of a micromanagement claim. So one practical tip for people who are specialists in the room that have to deal with managers where complaints are made or there are issues around behaviours in the workplace, when you're actually talking to those people, ask them to play you the movie and not give you the movie review. And so by that I mean what are the specific behaviours that you say someone is a micromanager because the answer will be, well, they're harsh and they're, well, they're picky. I can't see what harsh looks like. I can't hear what picky looks like. So what are the specific behaviours that I can see or hear that lead you to conclude that somebody is harsh or picky as a micromanager? Because often what happens is people want to give you the movie review, so you buy the movie review. Your, your role is to work out what that uh, movie looks like, so somebody needs to play it to you. Okay, conscious of time. So the little top part of that triangle, dealing with performance, what are the options then? What are the reasonable response action options? So if we look at it again in that safety framework, what are the reasonable response actions that I have at my disposal as a manager to deal with inappropriate behaviour? And rather than talk about formal or informal, I'd rather use the language of low intensity through to higher intensity because it's really all on the record. It can range at the very bottom from do nothing, and by do nothing I mean a documented, considered do nothing. I'm satisfied from what someone's come and shared with me that nothing needs to be done at the moment, but I've made a note that I've actually turned my mind to the issue and I've decided not to do anything, okay? That's a considered do nothing weighing up the risk as opposed to I just ignored the problem. Because it's a pretty bad look if there's a big blow up and work safe come in and start asking questions Workers' comp claims managers get asked, "What did you do?" When somebody and, and, it, and it turns out that somebody's actually come and confided in someone. It's invaluable when you've got a note to say, "I actually turned my mind to it, and this is why I did what I did." General feedback's the next level for me. What's good about general feedback is sometimes people don't want to um, name who, who the people are that are concerned by behaviours because it'll reveal the identity of the of the people complaining, particularly if it's a very dominant, aggressive type personality in a, in, a, in a higher level role. And again, consistent what I say about show up in your managerial game, is there's nothing stopping managers from saying, I've observed the way you interact with other people in the workplace and I don't consider it appropriate and I don't consider that to be good performance from a manager. So again, there's nothing disciplinary about that. I don't need to give you names and examples and details because it's not disciplinary. And if you're telling me you're not doing any of those things, terrific. But guess what? If you were doing those things, they're not the type of behaviours that would lead you to stay in this organisation. Next level specific feedback, where you are going to give the details. We jump into facilitated discussion. So before we rush off to mediation, sometimes it's a case of getting the parties in the room with a third party to help guide the discussion and often give some feedback back to the manager who's dealing with the issue. And as I say, that's more coming from the point of view of helping them be the best they can, rather than just jumping straight into this, I'm being bullied and we need to investigate it. Mediation definitely has its place, but I sometimes see that being, again, too much of an option of alternative resort to the investigation. Um, and by that I mean sometimes managers haven't done the homework to identify if the issue is that employees don't understand the expectations of the role, what's required of them, it, it's not very supportive of a manager telling a manager who's doing the right thing and managing something appropriately that they now have to go off to mediation where there's an expectation that they're going to make concessions and meet somewhere in the middle. 
Equally, if, you, if you've got a pretty nasty, aggressive manager and a very meek and mild subordinate, it's not particularly helpful sending those two people off with a mediator either. That's, that's what's been part of the problem. So the better approach is to actually address the manager's behaviour more so than the complainants. Workplace assessments and inquiries, these are just really ways of falling short of jumping straight into a full-blown investigation. So again, if you're not really sure what's going on, what's wrong with getting somebody from a different department who's appropriately skilled to come in and look under the bonnet, interview people, find out what's going on and give a bit of an assessment, okay? It doesn't have to be on the balance of probabilities. There are no allegations. Nobody's being accused of anything. But what you really want to get is what you normally wait for in three months from an, for an investigation report, and that is just to find out what's been going on in the workplace. So why not cut straight to the chase and find out what's going on, and then take action to address it, again, without jumping into the disciplinary. And if we have to, we have to, um, and that's the way it ends. Look, I've run out of time, so I won't go into the um, bullying cases that I was going to, but I just wanted to finish off by saying that the Fair Work Commission set up the bullying jurisdiction. It's been around for about two years. A lot of employers were quite um, dismissive and fearful of it, concerned that the Fair Work would jump in and tell people how to run their workplaces and get really involved in, in everyday workplace conflict. I'm happy to say that really nothing of the sort has eventuated. The Fair Work Commission's been very reluctant to get in and resolve people's problems. And it's just a recent quote from a deputy president who was dealing with a bullying claim that involved a principal of a private school and some teachers. And in, in a way, it sort of illustrates the, I guess, the frustration of fair work that often we're dealing with workplaces where there are intelligent, educated professionals, but sometimes there's just this, you know, too ready preparedness just to handle the problem for somebody else to magically solve, make it available. And the statistics show that because out of the um, 1,401 applications, only seven of them have actually resulted in any orders being made. And Fair Work's really onto this. And in my opinion, have actually been pretty reasonable in how they've applied that test um, of bullying in, in a practical circumstance. Um, where this is a good example is you had a courier driver who was refusing to work as director, was late, a whole bunch of inappropriate behaviours, very frustrating sort of toxic employee to deal with. And his manager, and I, I, I only give this as a legal quote, he'd said to him at one stage, get in your truck and complete your run. And Fair Work Commission recognised that whilst that language was intemperate, lawyers like describing things like that in that manner, whilst his language was somewhat intemperate, you need to look at the process overall as to how he had managed this guy's performance and take into account that he was a pretty difficult sort of customer to deal with and looking at it from a sort of an whole point of view, a one-off instance or even sometimes a couple of instances over a longer period of time isn't going to sink the boat. Okay, So it's not going to mean that you're a bully because somebody showed that on two separate occasions you engaged in inappropriate behaviour that caused a risk to my health and safety, therefore that's bullying. So that's the question I would pose to the topic of proactively dealing with mental health and bullying in the workplace. Cameron. Thank you, Rob.